Welcome to Butterflies of the Biosphere. I'm Mark Colvin. And I'm Dan Danahar. Hi Dan. Hi. <laughs> well you brought me out today in this beautiful hot sunny day. Uh, we're in this lovely grassland meadow here uh, looking for dark green fertilities. No consideration for my hay fever whatsoever but hey you know what we do in the, in the interest of butterflies. Yeah well I think you just have to learn to live with that Mark really. I think you're right. The rewards are so great aren't they? Absolutely 100%. Well, it's kind of strange, really, because you're interviewing me today. It is indeed, yes. And uh, uh, obviously you are the species champion for the dark green fertility in Sussex, the Sussex branch of BC. Um, and uh, obviously that makes you an expert. Well, actually, you know what? That's a word that I really try to steer clear of because uh, I'd like to c uh, consider myself an enthusiast, uh, partly because that lets me off the hook. I don't need to know everything. And with a species like the dark green fertility, there's so much to learn anyway. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fairly unlooked at species if there's such a phrase i mean it's not something that we've got lots of studies on so uh that that's great because a lot of people have got an opportunity to get involved absolutely yeah So Dan, uh, dark green fertility, the most widespread of the British fertilities. Well, what's its status like in Sussex? Mostly restricted to the chalk mark. Uh, we've got quite large populations in the east, near mm. places like Wilmington Hill, Lullington Heath, uh, Friston Forest. Uh, although when I say Friston Forest, although it's in the forest, there's a lot of it on the grassland near the gallops. Then, of course, where we are at Castle Hill, seems to be having a really, really mm. good year this mm. year. I mean, I'm having a fantastic time seeing these insects today. Mm. Uh, and then uh, we go back to what you saw um, in the in, in the West. Uh, and, and, and data that I've looked at looks like there's an awful lot of between-site variation mm -hmm. as to when populations peak. And it could simply be a, a climatic gradient where you see them earliest in the West, or where, uh, where perhaps it's damper, and uh, later in the East where perhaps it's drier. Indeed. I mean, I realise that the first one in Sussex this year was seen here at Castle Hill Nature Reserve. Um, I mean, obviously, Colin Knight and I saw uh, two, possibly three, at Fairmile Bottom, which again is, of course, to the, the west of the county as well. Yeah, whereas I've been concentrating on the east, the far east of Beachy Head, mm. day after day, nothing. Mm. So, Dan, dark green fertility. Well, it's not really dark green, is it? It's a brown and black butterfly. Why dark green fertility? Or orangey, I think, actually, Mark. <laughs> the orange certainly stands All right. out for me. All right, it's orangey then. <laughs> it's an orange or brown butterfly. Yeah, yeah. Or orange, orange and black. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and of course, as you probably know, on the un on the hind wing underwings, sure. there's there's some some green there, which varies considerably from Indeed. specimen to specimen. In fact, in some cases, it's hardly green at all. It's more mm. mustardy in colour, mm. which makes them a slightly similar to the high brown, which of course we don't have here anymore. Sadly, yes. I mean, it used to occur throughout Sussex in many of the woodlands, but of course that died out, uh, you know, quite some time ago, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, and in fact, Nick Baker was telling me that as a child, because he lived here in the Ashdown Forest, he would go and collect the caterpillars and, and rear them through. So well, that must have been an amazing experience. But uh, no, yes. we don't have it here anymore. So Dan, why did you choose to become the species champion in Sussex for the dark green fertility? Well, you know, of all of the eight fertilities that we find in the UK, uh, this is probably done the best, uh, and yet it's not really received an awful lot of attention. And, and, and it struck me that what might be a good idea would be to monitor the species that's doing well, mm. because with climate change, you never know what's going to happen. Absolutely. So it made a lot of sense to me to, to look at this species, to see how it's doing now, so we've got a sort of a baseline idea about things, mm. uh, and, and that might help us understand what could be the problems in the future. It might also help with management in mm. some ways. A lot of these things, of course, with climate change, just shift geographically. So it may not be a problem for us at all. We may mm. just lose it or it may just expand, but it's good to have some knowledge. And of course, the other thing is, I think, that uh, obviously choosing a species that is doing well at the moment, you know, it's, it, it's no good waiting until we've lost something or we've almost yeah. lost something. You know, it's, let's get the data now, you know, while we can get the data. Yeah, exactly. That, that's so important. Yeah. I remember having a discussion with Marshall Morin about this, and he said, I don't really see why you're doing it, mm. <laughs> but he's going to hate me for saying that. <laughs> but that was my rationale, you know. That's why I, I felt it was important to do it. Sure. And already we have seen some really interesting data. Mm, good. You know, because over the last few years, uh, one thing which has become increasingly clear to me is that 
this species, because it spends what near 75% of its time as a, a first instar caterpillar, mm -hmm. it comes out the egg and it hatches. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it hatches out the egg and it stays for what you know the whole whole winter whole and winter many period, of the spring yeah. uh, as a caterpillar, hibernating. Sure. If you need, if you have a lot of rain during that period, mm. the likelihood is it's probably just going to drown. Mm. So that has already come out to be really a clear indicator when we've had lots and lots of rain. This species has not done well. So Darren, biology of dark green fritillary, obviously we've been lucky enough to see quite a few males flying around here, and hopefully there's a few females flying around as well, which we haven't seen yet. Um, but obviously once they've mated, um, egg laying takes place. Um, what are the actual food plants uh, that the, uh, the female lays her eggs on for the larvae? All right, well, they're violets, obviously. They, they go for common uh, dog violet if they have to, but when they have a choice and wet conditions, they'll go for marsh violet. And here in this wonderful sward here, it's Viola herta, the uh, hairy violet. Obviously, um, you know, the eggs are laid, and I believe these are laid generally singly, although in this small, not clumps, I mean, it'd be wrong to call them clumps, but they'll scatter them around in a small area. Yeah. Um, and then when the, the larvae hatch, what happens then? Well, immediately they're going to diapause. So okay. this, is, this is the thing which I've slowly been realising, that, that they become very vulnerable during this period where 75% of their time they are uh, hibernating. Uh, and if it rains on them, then they can drown. If they get, uh, if it's really, really damp, uh, presumably they get, they're susceptible to funguses and to molds. Mm. Although curiously, they seem to prefer damp habitats. Interesting. It is interesting. Mm. So you know, one might speculate that the, the, the it shouldn't be a problem, but the records that we've got correlate highly with the high abundances with very dry periods and low abundances, particularly during the, the this period when they're a caterpillar, with low abundances. That's very interesting. Now obviously, as you say, they go for into diapause, which is resting phase, and then obviously in the spring, the first instar uh, you, you know, emerges from this period and starts eating. Yeah. Um, and eat, doesn't it just, I mean, it, 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 it takes in a lot of sustenance, yeah. and that's the main purpose of the, the larval stage. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, this species is quite fussy when it comes to what it eats. You know, it will, it will eat a bit of one leaf and then walk across the turf and eat a bit more of another leaf. Mm. Uh, also, it's, it's a dark colour, the, the final instar, the final uh, skin change is very, very dark, uh, bluey black, uh, uh, and it, uh, it uses that colour to, to thermoregulate, to get as warm as it, as it possibly can, so its digestive system works, and off it goes and eats again. They obviously spend a lot of time with the larvae, because I think they go through, um, I think I'm right in saying it's five instars. Uh, yeah, five skin changes, that's right, yeah. Indeed, which is uh, quite considerable. Um, the actual adult butterfly, I mean, obviously once we've gone from uh, you know, the egg stage, go through the larval stage, the butterfly then pupates. Yeah. Um, but when the butterfly emerges, I believe in the south, this is typically mid-June. Yeah, yeah, and, and of course, the further north you go, the more delayed that becomes, because of course it's mm. cooler in the north. So if people want to see uh, the dark green fritillary on the wing in the biosphere, when should they go out looking? Now, and, and the date now is at the 24th of June. This is really, it's really beginning to kick off now. We're a little bit late this year, uh, uh, as I'd indicated earlier on. Even at Beachy Head now, you can't see any. Mm. But we're a little bit late, but now's the time. And Castle Hill being the core uh, site in the biosphere for nature conservation is the perfect place to go. Yeah, I can't help but, uh, while we're sitting here talking, I'm keep uh, glimpsing them out the corner of my eye flying around. Uh, me so. too, I'm seeing them and over I, your shoulder. <laughs> and I'm seeing them over your shoulder too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a fantastic place it's to a be. Fan it is, and it's, it's great just sitting here looking around, taking all the orchids and the butterflies and everything else. It's, uh, it's a gorgeous place. So Dan, we've uh, finished our walk around Castle Hill National Nature Reserve here in uh, East Sussex. Thoroughly enjoyable morning and uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much for showing me around and showing me the dark green fritillaries here. It's a site I've never been to before, so yeah, great morning. Uh, you, well, you're welcome, Mark, and, uh, and I'm very grateful that you've done the interviewing because uh, it's obviously a unique experience for me and I, now I know how my interviewees <laughs> feel. <laughs> yeah, terrified, I'm sure. <laughs> but no, I it's think been, not. Yeah. Yeah, it's been really, really enjoyable, but thank you very much. Well, man. you're welcome. Thank and you. on another note, if you see any dark green fritillaries in the biosphere or, or in Sussex or beyond, all you have to do is follow the instructions on the sightings page of Butterfly Conservation Sussex or the, equally on the Butterflies of the Biosphere Facebook page and you can get one of these amazing enameled 
dark green fritillary brooches, but there's only a few left now. I think we've got about 13 mm. left. I've got them. And I haven't yet. Thanks, Mark. Pleasure.